Amber had a poor memory of her childhood. It seemed like a grey mess, made up of different fragments. Playing with friends, eating oatmeal, napping in daycare, and speaking with her mother. Like a patchwork blanket, each fragment was a memory, but not all of them were good. One memory that stood out was the day her mother's friend gave her two soft toys for her birthday, a green cat and a blue dog. They were small but adorable, with smooth synthetic fur and bows around their necks. Amber was thrilled with such a gift. She never parted with her plush friends, took them for walks, put them to sleep on her pillow, and carefully covered them with a warm blanket. One day, when Amber was only five years old, she went for a walk in the rain. She often played alone in the yard, and her mother always assured her that she could see her daughter perfectly from the kitchen window, which meant that she was safe. However, Amber soon realized that her mother was more interested in watching TV than watching her daughter. On that gloomy day, there were no children outside. They preferred to sit in warm apartments drinking sweet tea with homemade cookies or sandwiches. They played dolls, board games, or watched cartoons, which were broadcast on TV in abundance over the weekend. Amber didn't have such a choice. She was bored at home, and she received no more attention than the dust under her bed. Therefore, right after breakfast, the girl put on her red rubber boots and ran out to measure the puddles. Of course, instead of friends, she took her kitten and puppy with her. You must be obedient, little ones, and sit here while I prepare a tasty oatmeal for you. The girl ordered her toy pets strictly, seating them on a low bench. Amber herself began to cook food from available materials, water, sand and sticks, which replaced spoons perfectly. Amber's toys were obedient, but the weather outside decided to play a cruel joke on the girl. The sudden gust of wind blew her toys straight into a puddle filled with dirty water. The puppy was lying face down in the water, and the kitten looked sadly at Amber with eyes like beads, lifting its paws up. My poor ones, the girl cried, throwing the bucket of sand oatmeal. She picked up the plush animals, trying to squeeze out the dirt from their paws and ears with her little hands. Amber was very upset at that moment, worrying about her toys. But the main disappointment was waiting for her ahead. At home, her mother, looking at Amber and the soft animals, pressed her chest, assessed the damage and wrinkled her nose. Amber, why did you get your jacket dirty? Look at yourself. Who do you look like? Amber blinked in incomprehension. Then she looked at herself, noticing the wet spots on her jacket and sleeves left by the toys. She was so worried about saving her toys from drowning that she didn't notice she had violated one of her mother's main prohibitions, to behave carefully. I just... she sniffed, but didn't finish her thought. Everything is simple for you, Amber. Do you think it's easy for me to wash your clothes every day and night? Can't you behave like a girl, not like a pig? Her mother grumbled, pulling off Amber's dirty jacket. Amber tried to explain that the cat and the dog fell. She wasn't guilty, it was the wind. But hearing the child's babble, her mother narrowed her eyes. Not guilty again. You're never guilty. Who takes dirty toys to the house anyway? Can I wash them? Amber asked, looking at her mother, hopefully. Of course not, Gloria replied. Do you think I don't have enough laundry to do? Look, there's a whole basin of your dirty clothes. And if you wash them, the stuffing inside will get ruined. Go throw them away. Mum, please. The girl couldn't help but sob. Tears gathered in Amber's blue eyes. She was sad at the mere thought of throwing her beloved toys away. How could she do such a thing to her friends? They were not garbage. Just give me those dust collectors. You don't need them. Her mother was angry, always irritated by children's tears. She snatched the stuffed animals from the girl's hands and, taking wide steps, threw them both 
into the trash can in the kitchen, right on top of potato and carrot peels. Don't cry, Amber, her mother scolded. This will be a lesson for you. Now you will know not to bring toys like these outside and you should take care of your things better. Amber wanted to sneak past her mother, steal the toys and hide them somewhere, but she was too scared to do so. So the little girl had to come to terms with the fact that anything valuable to her could be taken away by the slightest mistake. And there was no one to stand up for Amber because she had no other relatives besides her mother. Gloria and her daughter lived in a two-room apartment that had not seen repairs in a long time. They had no relatives. Amber's grandmothers and grandfathers did not spoil her with pies, and her father did not carry her on his shoulders. If the absence of grandmothers in the house did not bother the little girl much, the lack of a father distressed her when she went to kindergarten. She was almost four years old when the children rehearsed songs and poems for Father's Day. Most of the rhymes were dedicated to fathers. That's when Amber asked the logical question. Where is my father? She reasoned that he must exist. After all, her friend Haley had a father and he always picked her up after kindergarten first. And even the naughty bed, who often spitted and constantly took toys away, had a father. So... Amber's father must exist too. Naturally, she decided to find out the truth from her mother. They were returning home from kindergarten that evening along a familiar road. Mum, do I have a dad? The girl asked, holding her mother's hand tightly and quickly moving her feet to keep up with her adult steps. Gloria frowned, taking her eyes off the phone screen she was looking at on the way home and looked sternly at her daughter. Yes, he was, but he swam away, was her answer. Of course, such an answer did not satisfy the curious little girl. And where did he swim to? She latched onto the word. He is a sailor. He is on a ship? Yeah, a sailor, long haul. Her mother said it angrily. He left me a gift in the form of you and sailed to distant countries. And I was left on the shore. Amber frowned, trying to understand what she had heard. Of all her mother's words, she understood the main thing. Her father was a sailor, which was very cool. The girl perked up, and the next day she told all her friends at the daycare that her father was a sailor. She began to draw ships on paper, more like triangles hanging on a sheet. And also the sea in shades of blue, which consisted of curved lines that a child's hand carefully drew. She decided that one of these drawings would definitely be a gift to her father when his ship returned. Amber tried so hard that each drawing got better and better. Even her teacher noticed that, Dear, you have talent. However, when the daughter shared this news with her mother, Gloria only snorted, and then Amber found a stack of her drawings set aside for her father's arrival in the kitchen. Her mother wrapped something in them. In the future, when Amber drew, she no longer shared her drawings with her mother. When she went to first grade, a man appeared in their house. Only he was not a sailor. Thomas worked in the construction industry. He dealt with finishing apartments and their repairs. Thomas and Gloria met on a dating site. Maybe the worker didn't really appeal to the woman at first sight, but the prospect of changing the wallpaper in the living room was too attractive to pass up. Their relationship got off to a quick start. It couldn't be called a couple created in heaven, but it was a practical alliance. Gloria had an apartment that needed repairs, and in general, she needed masculine hands. Thomas did not have an apartment, so he was happy to change his rental housing for a two-room apartment in a good area. Soon the man and the woman, as they say, put up with each other and got married. But there was no place for Amber in their cramped world. However, Thomas regarded the girl neutrally, at least. Most of the time, Thomas didn't even notice Amber, but this arrangement suited them both. Amber never reached out to Thomas. 
She never tried to see her father in him. She had long since realized that the story about the sea was fiction, and they lived like this until Amber turned ten. When Amber came home from school with two A's in her school bag, for physical education and math, her mother greeted her with an unusual smile. The woman literally shone, standing in the narrow hallway and even helping her daughter take off her coat. The kitchen smelled of fried chicken and potatoes. The hungry girl's stomach growled instantly after sports games. Go wash your hands and quickly go to the table, her mother said, taking the heavy, book-filled school bag from her daughter. I also made a pie with apples, just like you love. Amber, not particularly used to such treatment, blinked in surprise. Her favorite dishes were only cooked by her mother on her birthday or when friends and guests came over, before whom her mother loved to show off her hospitality and housekeeping skills. Wow, cool. The girl smiled uncertainly and followed her mother's recommendations. Five minutes later, she was sitting in the kitchen with a large plate filled with delicious food. Amber, her mother said this triumphantly when the girl was eating her lunch. I have wonderful news for you. Amber swallowed a half-chewed piece of golden fatty potato, washing it down with a generous sip of cherry compote. By this point in her life, Amber was an intelligent and well-read girl. Moreover, she had already learned all the nuances of sarcasm. Therefore, a puzzle of her mother's great mood and this hint at the news of the day was instantly formed in her head. Great, the girl mentally stretched out. So they are finally sending me to an orphanage, and this is the farewell meal. She didn't say such a thing out loud. Gloria's mood went from good mood to I hate everyone in a split second. So Amber didn't want to tempt fate, swallowing the sarcastic remark with a piece of chicken. She smiled interestedly and asked, Did something good happen? I have two pieces of news, Gloria said. Firstly, I talked to Thomas and we decided to allow you to go to art school. You wanted to, right? Amber's cheeks turned red. She blinked in surprise. Yes, said the girl. She had been dreaming of this. However, her mother said that the prices for classes and additional expenses, such as albums and brushes for drawings, were too much for them. See how good it is. Her mother clapped her hands. And now, the second news. Gloria shone and put something strange in front of her daughter. At first, Amber didn't understand what it was, but then she stopped chewing. She had seen this in a series that her mother didn't allow her to watch. Is this a pregnancy test? The girl clarified. She didn't understand why her mother was so happy and why she put it on the table right in front of her plate. Her appetite was gone. Her mother, however, shone like a polished coin. She nodded, pleased with her daughter's intuition. Yes, exclaimed Gloria. You will have a little brother or sister, Amber. Can you imagine? Thomas and I are expecting a baby. Hmm, Amber responded thoughtfully. Great. She didn't know how to react to such news. Well, the baby will come and that's it. He or she won't appear tomorrow, so the joy of meeting can be rehearsed later. Besides, the babies didn't interest her at her age. Fortunately, her mother didn't delve into her daughter's emotions. She reveled in her own happiness. Imagine the delight, Gloria chattered, grabbing the test strip and lovingly looking at it as if it were some kind of miracle of light. There will be the sound of children's feet and laughter in this house again, and the first words, oh, I remember when you were so little. Here, Gloria's eyes filled with genuine nostalgic tears. Meanwhile, Amber looked at her mother in amazement. 
Her life didn't prepare her for this turn. What caused Gloria's excessive emotionality? Joy from motherhood or hormonal imbalance? A mystery that had no answer. However, for the first time in her life, during the next eight months, Gloria really tried to find a common language with her daughter. Gloria began to take an interest in Amber's affairs. She started giving her advice on her appearance, talking about boys, school, and her daughter's interests. She took her to art school, enjoyed when the teacher praised her daughter. Amber reacted to changes in her family, like a wary wild animal being tamed and lured with tasty treats. On one hand, she desperately wanted to allow herself to be petted. But on the other hand, she feared that the hand stroking her might suddenly strike her. A kind and caring mother was something unfamiliar and strange to her. However, in a couple of months, Amber had already gotten used to her mother's kindness. The girl eagerly ran home from school to tell her mother about her achievements or share other news. Perhaps that's why the birth of a child became a catastrophic change for Amber. Samantha was born in the spring, and all the attention and all the love of the mother and stepfather instantly fell on the newborn girl. The older daughter was not just forgotten. She was completely excluded from the family. They only remembered her when it was necessary to help with something. Amber felt like she was deprived of oxygen. Sometimes she sat in the same room with her family, looked at her mother, stepfather and little Samantha, and a worm of jealousy and resentment gnawed at her from the inside. It seemed to her that she was superfluous at this celebration of life, as if she were in a theatre and just watching someone else's happiness from the front row. At first, she tried to point out to her mother how unfair it was. Oh, don't make things up, her mother angrily retorted. You should know that parents love all their children equally. It's just that your little sister needs more attention, more maternal warmth and more affection right now. She's just a tiny thing. The changes in the family happened not gradually, but all at once. Amber's toys were all given to the little one because, according to Gloria, she was already grown up and didn't need them. Yes, perhaps her mother was right, but it hurt Amber that she didn't even ask for her opinion on the matter. Later, Samantha, taking their mother away from Amber, set her sights on her things. She spoiled everything she touched. Gloria always waved away Amber's accusations with the usual phrases. You're just so jealous and demanding, Amber. I didn't raise you like this. You should be ashamed that you don't share with your sister. Why did her three-year-old sister need Amber's cosmetics? That was already a different question. Judging by everything, a rhetorical one, because her mother preferred not to answer it. There were many pictures of little Samantha in the house. They hung in large frames on the wall, stood on bedside tables, and were attached to magnets on the refrigerator. And at the same time, there were no photos of Amber in the apartment, as if the girl didn't live there. Amber became an independent child early on. As a result, as soon as she grew up a little, a lot of responsibility for her younger sister fell on her shoulders. She learned too early how to rock the baby to sleep during the day, put her on the potty, feed her, and take her for walks. Amber, being a good girl, still accepted this situation. It was difficult for her to be angry with her younger sister. However, Amber couldn't help but notice how different her sister's childhood was from hers. She remembered that her mother often yelled at her. No, she didn't raise her hand, but she put her in the corner or punished her for the slightest offence. Her little sister was allowed to do absolutely everything. Money was also a pressing issue in the house. Her mother was on maternity leave, her father was working, but he had no desire to sponsor his adopted daughter. So, when Amber stuttered that she needed to buy something for school, hand over money for a class trip, or 
would like to get something for herself, her mother always got furious. You have excessive appetites, Amber, she scolded. Go and earn it yourself if you need the money so badly. We don't have any extra money. In such moments, Amber had to go back to her teacher, blush and lie, saying that she wouldn't go to the theatre because she was very busy. At the same time, every time her three-year-old sister pointed her finger at a toy in the store, it was instantly paid for and ended up in her eager little hands. If her mother brought home treats, she never offered them to Amber. All the chocolates, yogurts and cookies went to the youngest. You're already a big girl, Amber. You need to watch your figure, not eat sugar. Samantha is small. She has baby teeth, while you should save your teeth. Samantha was given the most beautiful clothes and allowed to get them dirty, which was considered adorable. In her childhood, Amber had to wear clothes from acquaintances, and even when the pants that she had survived three generations of children were torn, her mother looked at her dissatisfied. One day, Gloria came into her room and announced, You will no longer be able to attend your painting classes. The woman stated categorically. Amber raised her head from the book she had been reading at that second and exclaimed in fright, What? Why? She loved her art school. There, the girl felt at home. Because it's too expensive, explained her mother, examining the fresh manicure on her nails. Samantha will go to a private kindergarten in September. We can't afford so many expenses. But the school isn't that expensive. Amber was amazed. A penny saved is a penny earned, her mother retorted in her own way. But you can send Samantha to a regular kindergarten, Amber suggested, grasping at straws. There's a great daycare centre near our house. My classmate's younger brother goes there. They say there's even a swimming pool. So you really want to send your younger sister to such a nursery school just to please yourself and your desires? I didn't expect such selfishness from you. Her mother shook her head, sighing. No, Amber, the subject is closed. Forget about your brushes. You won't become an artist. Think for yourself. All artists are hungry beggars. Do you want that? And anyway... Instead of disappearing in the evenings on such a useless activity, you'd better help me at home, prepare dinner, clean the apartment. If you haven't noticed, I already do all that, the girl flared up. And I walk with Samantha, and if you want to save money, you can stop dressing up the snotty girl in branded dresses, for example. Go to the salon less often for a manicure and pedicure. And I'm your daughter too, Mum. You have to take some responsibility for me. Of course, Amber quickly regretted her words. Not because she didn't think that way. Her words were sincere. However, the way Gloria's eyes narrowed frightened her to no end. How dare you talk to me like that, Amber? I gave you everything. I gave birth to you, didn't sleep at night. You're clothed, fed and shod. So you shouldn't shout at me, ungrateful girl. Her mother grabbed whatever was at hand, Samantha's backpack, and threw it across the room, aiming for the head of her eldest daughter. Amber dodged, shocked at her enraged mother. Samantha came running from her parents' bedroom at the sound of shouting. She watched the events unfold with interest. Even then, Amber understood that the child wasn't afraid, just curious. Perhaps she even hoped that her older sister would be punished. When Samantha turned six, she moved from her parents' bedroom to her older sister's room. For Amber, such cohabitation became a new circle of hell and a test of her nerves. The girl constantly took her things without asking. Coming home from school, Amber often found a mess in the common room. Samantha could cut Amber's favourite top with scissors draw on her work notebooks with coloured markers, tear up books. I can't live in the same room with her. Amber could not stand it and said, looking at the destruction caused by her younger sister with tears in her eyes. She's doing it on purpose. Look at what she did to my notebook. 
There was a final essay due tomorrow. Now I'll have to write a new one at night. The girl waved scraps of the notebook. It looked as if a dog had torn her apart. At this time, cunning Samantha hid behind her mother's back. She peeked out from there with a mischievous expression on her face, perfectly understanding that she wouldn't be punished for this prank. You know what, dear? The mother said. If you don't want to share a room with your sister, then you can go work and rent your own place. You're already almost 18, Amber, so be independent. And while you live under my roof, so you have no right to complain. Amber had to remain silent, gritting her teeth in frustration. It only got worse. The girl often sat at her laptop to prepare for final exams. And of course, at such times, Samantha demanded that her sister give her the computer right now. I want to play games, the spoiled girl demanded. You're bothering me, Samantha. Amber waved her away, trying in vain to concentrate on the material she was reading on the screen. When I finish, I'll give you the computer right away. Play something else for now, with dolls, for example. I don't want to play with dolls, Samantha stamped her foot. I want to play on the computer. I want it now, right now. Go away, I said. The elder raised her voice. I told you I need to study. Faced with such a harsh response, the child immediately started crying. Her lips trembled, her hands shook and her face turned red. Mommy, she called out. Gloria rushed out of the kitchen, giving her daughters a stern glance. What happened again? Amber, why is your sister crying? She wants the laptop and I have to study. Amber explained. I'll give it to her when I'm done. Just give it to her now. She's little. Their mother snapped, wiping away the child's tears and snot with her hand. You can sit later. For now, read your books. We didn't have computers in my day. We made do with the library. Amber tried to assert her right to use the laptop, but all her arguments fell on deaf ears. It was no surprise that by the time she graduated from school, Amber's fixed idea was to attend a university in another city, far away from her family. Time passed, and fortune finally smiled broadly and kindly on Amber. Her main dream came true. She was accepted into a university on a scholarship. Although calling Amber's enrollment in a prestigious university luck would be blasphemy, the girl had put too much effort into getting there, when Amber found out that she had been accepted, she felt dizzy with happiness. She ran into the kitchen where the whole family was gathered for dinner, her eyes sparkling with joy and the corners of her mouth stretched almost to her ears in a happy smile. Mum, I got in. I'm going to study architecture, just like I've always dreamed. I told you I applied, remember? She exclaimed. The mother only nodded and a smile appeared on her lips only when Samantha chimed in. The girl refused the meatballs and was eating a sweet pie for dinner. You're leaving, Amber, she asked. So I'll be living in your room, like a grown-up. Gloria laughed, patting her youngest daughter's dark curls just like her own. Don't be in such a hurry to grow up, Samantha, Gloria said gently. But yes, you'll be living alone. As the younger sister expressed her excitement with joyful squeals, Mum gave Amber a serious look. You got a scholarship, right, Amber? We can't afford to pay for university. You understand that, don't you? Amber, who just wanted someone to be happy for her and for once be praised for her success, felt deflated. Her shoulders drooped and her smile turned into a ghost of past joy. Yes, Mum. She nodded uncertainly, shifting from her heels to her toes. The dormitory is also covered, and there will be a scholarship. It's small, of course, but I think I can find a part-time job. Of course, you'll have to work. Adult life is expensive, Mum said sternly. We can't help you, Amber. Now Samantha goes to school and does gymnastics. We want to enrol her in singing, since she sings so beautifully. But she used to go to art school. 
Amber replied absent-mindedly, not understanding how the conversation about her future had turned into her sister's skills. Oh, you know, the teacher turned out to be so unpleasant. Mum waved her hand, making an annoyed face. Samantha didn't like it there. Amber nodded, feeling lost. She knew that her sister changed sections every couple of months. But it wasn't the teacher's fault. It was the student's fault. Samantha hated obeying orders from others. She didn't know what discipline and subordination were. However, Gloria persistently dragged her from one activity to another, starting at age three. So Samantha had tried Zumba, swimming, taekwondo, drawing, singing in a folk choir, etc. As Amber had returned to her room, she couldn't help but think that her family didn't even invite her to the table. Her new life began in August, when she was warmly welcomed into the student dormitory. Of course, there were rules and problems. One of Amber's roommates, Hope, was quite a slob. Candy and chocolate wrappers that she had eaten could be found in the most unpredictable places. She could fall asleep with cookie and sandwich crumbs on her laptop keyboard. She could throw things on the floor or turn the music up so loud that the other residents of the dormitory would flock to the sounds of the disco like moths to a flame. However, what did Amber, who had spent several years in one room with a restless and mischievous younger sister, care about such trifles as a candy wrapper? Moreover, she found a common language with Hope and they became good friends. Time passed quickly. Amber studied and worked. By the time she graduated from university, she had lost touch with her relatives completely. At first, Amber sent parcels with gifts to her hometown, but received a dry thank you in return. Gloria was not particularly interested in the fate of her eldest daughter. They called on holidays and then switched to sending greetings cards. The years at the university passed unnoticed. Freshly baked architects broke free, but they didn't know what to do next. Amber was luckier. She hit the bullseye on her first try. The girl knew what she wanted from her first year of study. Amber planned to go to Spain, so she sent a carefully crafted portfolio to Ricardo Garcia's architectural firm. She didn't really expect a response, and she was surprised when she received a huge letter asking her to start collecting documents for working abroad. Of course, Amber was taken on as an intern. She spent only two years in the beautiful country, but returned to her homeland as a new person. Amber was more confident than ever in herself and her abilities. And the internship at such a prestigious architectural firm and the recommendations of Ricardo Garcia became her business card. This was the beginning of a new stage in the girl's life. She got a job as an architect at a capital firm, starting her career. The talented girl quickly adapted to her new environment. She found many good and interesting people. Her life was full of surprises. However, life likes to turn things upside down. It was summer outside. Amber turned 30, and she invited her close friends to celebrate her birthday on Friday. It's not hard to guess that Saturday was tough for Amber. She and her friends had so much fun that her body now needed a full night's sleep, water and a couple of aspirin. Amber planned to lie in bed until noon at least. She would only get out of bed to get something delicious and watch TV shows. But then the doorbell rang, interrupting her plans for a lazy weekend. At first, Amber thought the ringing was a dream. Oh, who could it be? The woman muttered, covering her head with a blanket. No one is home. She hoped the person would leave her alone. However, the ringing continued. Then it started ringing non-stop as the persistent visitor held down the button. When someone started knocking on the door, Amber couldn't take it any more. She sighed discontentedly, threw off her blanket, and putting on her slippers, shuffled over to the door. Opening the front door, Amber yawned and stared at the guest. It was her younger sister. And not just one. Next to Samantha was a little girl, apparently her daughter. 
Amber knew that her younger sister had become a single mother, but she didn't go into the details. Amber had only seen her niece in photos on social networks. Well, finally, Samantha exclaimed in annoyance, waving her hands. I thought I'd have to spend the night in the entrance. Then she commanded the child, grabbing her hand. Come in, Nikki. You'll meet your aunt in person. Her name is Amber. Chatting with the child, the sister pushed Amber with her shoulder and slipped inside. She dragged a large suitcase on wheels behind her. Amber looked at her younger sister in shock, wondering if she should pinch herself. I must still be sleeping, thought Amber, in her hazy state of mind. Meanwhile, Samantha was already admiring the spacious hallway with a beautiful wardrobe. Wow, you hit the jackpot, sis. The hallway is bigger than our bedroom. How much did this fancy apartment cost? How did you get here? Amber answered with a question. Frankly, she had long forgotten that she had a sister or a family. Relatives didn't reciprocate with her. Amber wasn't even sure if her mother knew she was still alive. She still sent them cards and transferred money for holidays, but there was no response. And she certainly didn't expect to see her relatives on her doorstep. You know how. I bought plane tickets, then took a taxi, and voila, we're here, she said to her sister, raising her eyebrows. You don't seem happy to see us. And I brought you a niece, by the way. Maybe you could feed us after the trip? Samantha hesitated for a long time, not revealing the true reason for her trip to Amber. However, after an hour, when they had their second cup of coffee, she gave in. I have nowhere to live, Amber. Nicky's father left me. He was married, but he said he would leave his wife. Finally, when I got pregnant, he asked me to terminate it. I wanted to trick him into leaving the child so that he would stay with me. But eventually he got angry when he found out about my lie, and it was too late to get rid of the child at that time. What about your parents? Amber asked, knowing that Gloria and Thomas adored Samantha. We argued, the brunette said, looking away. I can't go back to them. Okay, what do you want from me? Amber asked, raising an eyebrow. Shelter us for a while. The younger sister begged, grabbing Amber's hands and looking into her eyes devotedly. You have a huge apartment, and Nicky and I don't need much space. I want to start a new life in the city. I'm studying to be a manicurist. I'll get a job in a salon. Here, the masters earn a lot. As soon as I'm on my feet, I'll leave right away. Please help us, sis. Amber sighed heavily. The prospect of sharing living space with Samantha again did not appeal to her. But how could she throw her out on the street? Especially since Amber felt sorry for Nicky, who had just turned two years old. She was quiet, silent, and had not spoken a word or made a sound the whole time. Okay, she waved her hand. But you're not here to stay permanently, Samantha. Find a job and rent a place. And so Samantha and Nicky occupied the living room, and the longer the sister lived with Amber, the more impudent she became. Without asking, she took her sister's perfumes and an expensive cream that her sister had received as a birthday gift. Samantha, I thought you had grown out of this, Amber exclaimed, noticing the traces of her sister's interference in her personal space. Oh, are you greedy for your face cream? Samantha shrugged. I left mine at home. I don't mind, but it's unhygienic at least, the sister frowned. The same situation was with food. Samantha often stayed at home all day and ate all the food in the fridge. Samantha. Amber tried to explain things to her sister. If you want to eat something, please take care that the food doesn't run out. I come home from work late and I'm hungry too. I didn't know you were so greedy, Amber. Samantha batted her eyelashes. That's how the city spoiled you. Amber only sighed realizing that it was pointless to explain the rules of basic etiquette to her spoiled sister. But the worst was yet to come. Amber soon realized that her younger sister was a lousy mother. She paid no attention to her child and only focused on her personal life. Sometimes Amber would come home and realize that the child had not been fed. At such moments, she quickly made some oatmeal or an omelette, 
which the child eagerly devoured. Samantha also didn't take her daughter for walks. Most of the time, the little girl sat alone, quietly playing with pots or jars. This whole picture struck a chord in Amber's heart. One day, Amber returned from work and saw Nikki sitting in the corner, quietly sobbing. As she approached, she felt an unpleasant smell. Samantha, when did you change the baby's diaper? The woman exclaimed, taking the child in her arms. Listen, I don't remember, Samantha said, not looking up from her phone. I just met a guy from the city on the app. If everything goes well, I'll become a... Amber stopped listening to her sister's stories about her admirer. She took off the child's pants, which had become wet from the seeping moisture. The diaper was heavy and full. Nikki's buttocks were bright red and apparently sore. The little girl didn't cry, she just sniffled, clinging to Amber. The woman carefully washed her, wrapped her in a clean terry towel, the softest one they found in the house. Why is Nikki still wearing diapers, Samantha? You should be teaching her to use the potty. Why aren't you spending time with her? The child is not developing. She doesn't know anything and can't do anything, and it's your fault. Samantha reacted to such accusations, either with anger or tears. She always had excuses. Either it was hard for her to take care of the child alone, or she was too young for that. One day, Samantha begged Amber to come home early from work because she had a business meeting. When Amber arrived, Samantha was primping in front of the mirror, humming a popular hit tune. She wore her older sister's dress, and she smelled of her luxury perfume, which Amber saved and used only on special occasions. At first, Amber wanted to tell Samantha everything she thought of her audacity, but then she just shrugged. I hope the meeting goes well, the woman remarked. You've been living here for over a month, Samantha. It's time to get a job and a place to live. Don't grouse, the brunette smirked, applying crimson lipstick. What will you do when we leave? Will you miss Nikki? You spend all your time with her. You read books, play games, go for walks. I spend time with her because I feel sorry for her, Amber frowned. And by the way, why is she sleeping now? It's already evening. What will she do at night? She's been lethargic all day and sleeping. Samantha waved her hand so you won't have any trouble with her. Approaching Nikki, Amber tenderly stroked her head. As soon as her fingers touched the girl's forehead, she gasped. Oh, Samantha, Nikki's hot. Why are you just sitting there? We need to see the doctor. Samantha looked at her sister in surprise, then at her watch. Amber, I'm going to be late. Can you handle this yourself, okay? I already have to run. Amber was in such shock that she didn't even yell at her sister. She couldn't understand how a mother could set her priorities like this, neglecting a child's health and not even noticing her condition. Nevertheless, Samantha left, and Amber had to take care of her niece alone. She arrived at the doctor, and he calmed Amber down a little. The girl's lungs are good. You should have brought her temperature down earlier, of course. Her glands are inflamed. I'll prescribe a spray for treatment. Amber just nodded, listening to the doctor and holding Nikki close to her chest. She was anxious about the child at that moment. Samantha came home after a day. I'm sorry, she smiled, appearing in the apartment. I was held up. Held up, the older sister exclaimed. Samantha, where were you? Interviews aren't conducted at night. I was actually thinking of starting to call police and hospitals. Listen, Amber, you're not my mum. I had some fun. Michael invited me on a date and I went there right after the business meeting. Amber, I'm young. I can't just sit at home all the time like a prisoner. You should. You should. And you will. Because right now you don't belong to yourself. Amber was angry. You have a child. She got sick and she is your responsibility. Amber's words clashed against her younger sister's frivolity like peas against a wall. After three months of such a life, Amber realised that something had to change. Samantha, I'm giving you a two-week deadline. Either you find a job or you move back in with your parents. You're not living with me anymore, she said firmly. The ultimatum yielded results, but not what Amber had hoped for. One day she returned from work 
carrying paper grocery bags in her hands. But the house was silent. Amber even wondered if her sister had gone out. But when she walked into the living room and flicked on the light switch, she saw Nikki, who had curled up on the couch. Her face and eyes were wet and red, as if she had been crying for a long time. But by the time Amber came, there were no tears left. Nikki, where is Mummy? Amber asked the child, approaching her. She found the answer on the table. Next to the empty vase, there was a note, on which Samantha's handwriting was scrawled in curvy, sprawling handwriting. A message for Amber. Amber, I'm sorry, but I've fallen in love and I can't stay here and bring up my daughter. I'm leaving with Michael for Bali. I've always dreamed of it. He doesn't know I have a daughter and I can't admit it. I can't waste my beauty and youth on raising a stupid child. Having Nikki was a huge mistake. I can't even look at her. She's a mute burden, and I sense she hates me too. I don't care if you throw her in the trash or give her to an orphanage. Amber read the note three times before she realized the meaning of her sister's terrible words. Her fingers shook with shock. She realized she was crying only when the tears rolled onto the paper, making the letters blurry with moisture. Samantha, how could you? She whispered in horror. She didn't mean herself, not at all. She felt so sorry for Nicky at that moment that her heart clenched to the point of pain. She turned around to look at the quiet little girl who had just been tossed into somebody else's nest by her cuckoo mother, flitting away. Suddenly, Amber crumpled the note in anger, throwing it to the floor. She walked over to the little girl, hastily wiping away her tears with the sleeve of her silk blouse, and asked with a gentle, encouraging smile, "'Well, sweetie, how are you? Are you hungry?' Of course, Nikki did not answer. She stared blankly in front of her, as if she understood her mother had abandoned her. Swallowing the lump in her throat, Amber took the child in her arms. She chattered incessantly, talking to the girl about everything. Then she fed her, washed her, brushed her dark curls and braided them. That night, she took the child to her bed. Until Nikki fell asleep, Amber told her stories. She herself did not sleep a wink. Heavy thoughts were weighing on her mind and soul. I can't leave her, the woman thought, stroking her sleeping niece on her back. I'm going on a business trip for a month in a week. Where am I going to leave her? Later, Amber tried to call her mother, but the conversation was short. Samantha did not listen to me. She gave birth to a married man. She's embarrassed us for the whole town. So let her handle the child herself, her mother said, hanging up the phone. A few days later... Amber took her niece to the orphanage. She hoped to explain the situation and maybe keep the child at the orphanage for a while. I'll visit you often, she informed Nikki, who was sitting in the infant seat of her car. Also, it will never be boring there. There are many children there. There are beautiful and interesting toys, and they always feed kids very well. You have such a good appetite. I think you'll be praised, honey. Amber parked her car next to the orphanage and looked at the building from the car's windshield. A minute later, she sighed and resolutely got out of the car. She swung open the passenger door and took Nicky in her arms. At the same time, Amber deliberately smiled, constantly telling herself how many good things awaited her in the new place. But no matter how cheerful her aunt's tone was, Nicky felt her uncertainty. The closer they got to the yellow-coloured building, the tighter the little girl clutched Amber. Then she sobbed sharply and clung to Amber's neck with her arms. Her face was pressed into her aunt's shoulder when the girl suddenly squeaked, quietly and inarticulately, Mummy! Amber froze on the porch of the orphanage. Her face was contorted with a grimace of pain. She clutched the girl tighter. What? Nikki? she whispered. Mummy? the girl repeated more clearly. Tears sprang from Amber's eyes. Mummy is the first word in the life of a child. Usually, 
and it is so long awaited for loving parents. The fact that the girl gave this word to her and not to her own mother made Amber feel unbearably hard. She turned sharply on her heels and walked quickly back to the car. Amber drove away from the orphanage swiftly, as if she feared being caught up or changing her mind. And so Amber had a daughter, not a niece. Having arranged the necessary connections, Amber was able to get custody of Nikki. Samantha readily and even happily allowed it. Not all friends understood Amber's choice. What a fool you are, Amber, said her colleague Dolores. Of course you feel sorry for the child. I also feel sorry for the cats and dogs on the street. But if I bring them all home, what will come out of it? Don't compare my niece to a stray kitten, Amber frowned. And I'm not comparing, Dolores waved her hand. Just think about it. You're already 30. First you didn't build a personal life because you were busy with your career. And now what? Do you want to stay alone with a child in your arms? You don't have to be Mother Teresa and help everyone. You should help yourself. Do you need all these problems? Yes, I need, Amber categorically nodded, remembering Nikki's eyes. If the man is decent and the other I don't need, then the child will not be a burden for him. Dolores only shook her head, sighing dejectedly. However, Amber was right. Soon, a decent man appeared in her life, and she found him through Nikki. On the weekend, Amber took her adopted daughter to the park to feed pigeons and ducks. They also decided to have a picnic. The weather was beautiful. There were no clouds in the sky. The city was covered in a warm Indian summer. The trees stood green, not rushing to turn yellow and shed their leaves. The woman and the girl settled down on the grass under the shade of a spreading tree. They laid down a plaid blanket and took out some goodies from rustling bags. Amber involuntarily thought that she began to look at the world differently after being near a small child. Being a city resident and a career woman, she was always rushing to get somewhere. She always had a schedule and a clear plan for her life. She was forced to relax and go with the flow. Amber, however, surprisingly liked this change. While telling the child about the changes in nature, Amber noticed them herself. She learned to enjoy a sunny day, to rejoice in leisurely weekends, and to take joyful walks. When they were refreshed, Nikki began to run on the grass, throwing a small ball. Amber leaned back against a tree trunk, watching her daughter. She noted with amazement how quickly the girl had grown stronger. She began to walk and run confidently. Her cheeks rounded, became ruddy. Nikki talked a lot. Amber did not understand all the words, but she tried very hard to understand her little girl. Suddenly, Nikki laughed and pointed somewhere with her finger. Amber looked in that direction and immediately jumped up, seeing a huge Labrador. She liked pets, of course, but only if they were muzzled and leashed. The dog was well-groomed, and its chocolate-covered coat glistened in the sun. Amber, however, tensed and immediately took the child closer to her. Nikki continued to point at the dog and demanded to stroke him. "'Don't be afraid, he doesn't bite,' said a child's voice cheerfully. Amber turned around, noticing a charming little boy. He looked about five or six years old, no more. "'Is that your dog?' Amber smiled, still holding her daughter close to her. The boy nodded, looking proudly at the pet. "'He was given to me by my dad when I was very young,' he explained, adding, "'I'm quite an adult, of course.' Amber suppressed a smile, nodding seriously to the boy. Meanwhile, the boy called to the pet in a thin and sonorous voice. Spike! The dog rushed to his young master's voice, noticing that the boy rubbed its ears and stroked its head. Nicky demanded to pet the dog even more, looking hopefully at Amber and saying, Mummy, please! Amber pressed her lips together. Every time the girl called her mummy, the woman's heart melted like ice cream in the sun. "'Can we pet your friend?' she asked politely. The boy smiled broadly, nodding. "'Of course!' That's how Nikki got her hands on the pet. The dog waited patiently till the girl stroked it ineptly with her small palm. The Labrador sat with his tongue out and breathed noisily. Nikki laughed with delight and then hugged the dog, tucking her nose into its fur. 
Nikki, Amber paled, who was already worried watching this picture. Don't worry, Spike is the calmest dog in the world, said a pleasant baritone, and he's very fond of children. A man stealthily approached them, and what a man, a blue-eyed blonde with a Hollywood smile. In a blue t-shirt and light jeans, he seemed to jump out of a popular melodrama, breaking a couple of women's hearts in the process. Amber looked away embarrassed, and then quickly pulled herself together and nodded to the man. You know, judging by his size, he may like children for breakfast too, she joked back, still nervous about her daughter's safety. The blonde man chuckled briefly and walked over to the children and the dog. He squatted down and stroked the dog's side, saying, When Josh was still a baby, Spike worked part-time for us as a babysitter. Whenever Josh whimpered in the cradle, Spike would jump up, rest his paws on it, and start rocking. What a smart dog, Amber smiled, relaxing a little. Your daughter is delighted, the man nodded at Nikki, who glowed with happiness when the dog licked her forehead. Do you have any pets? No, unfortunately I don't have time, Amber responded, already imagining how she would try to cope with work, a child and an animal. The man smiled softly. Yes, that's what I thought too. I picked up Spike in the winter. Someone had thrown him out in the cold as a puppy and he had a broken paw. Only later did I realise how lucky I was to have him. When a pet is around, a child doesn't feel lonely because he always has a friend. In addition, a pet is a kind of inoculation against selfishness because a child can learn to care and look after someone other than himself. Amber had never thought of animals in this way. Rather, the presence of a dog in the house seemed to her as hair in the corners, dirty paw prints and torn wallpaper. Listening to the stranger was pleasant. The warmth with which he spoke about the dog and then about his son resonated in Amber's soul. Amber did not notice how she and her new acquaintance settled down on her plaid. Amber offered him a seat on the blanket and they both watched Josh and Nicky play with Spike. The children tossed Nicky's ball to the Labrador and he brought it back to their feet in his mouth. The man and woman got to talking. The stranger introduced himself as Paul and he worked as a cook in a popular restaurant. Amber had time to note that there was no ring on the man's finger, and he did not mention his wife, talking about his life with his son. Soon, Paul himself said that he was a single father, without going into details. This fact made Amber even more interested in an attractive man. After all, she was just beginning to raise a daughter who had literally fallen on her head, while Paul had a lot of experience under his belt. While they were talking, they didn't notice how the weather had abruptly turned bad. The wind picked up, the sky was covered with clouds. A couple of moments later, the first large drops began to hit the ground. At first rare, they appeared more and more often, confidently turning into a downpour. To the squeals of the children, who were not in the least bit disappointed by this turn, the adults quickly gathered the plaid and the rest of the food. I have a car at the park entrance. I'll give you a ride, the man shouted as they ran out of the park with the rest of the strolling crowd. We live nearby, Amber responded. However, Paul insisted on his own. In turn, Amber strongly stated that he and Josh were obliged to stop by to dry off and drink hot tea so as not to get sick. Even though Amber saw Paul for the first time in her life, she felt something special inside her. The budding flame of falling in love she couldn't ignore the fact that as soon as he smiled, butterflies began to flutter inside her, brushing against her ribs, tickling her from the inside out and making her smile back. The man and woman, having fed the children, cozied up in the kitchen. They drank more than one cup of tea, but both of them did not want to part, although Amber realised just one more drop and she would simply burst. Well, we've been here for a long time. It's time to go home, said the man finally getting up from his seat. Amber looked away, not knowing what else to say. She didn't want to part with Paul. The children are quiet, Amber commented worriedly, walking into the living room. There's a proverb. When children stand quiet, they have done some harm. Do you think they have already painted your wallpaper and I should allocate funds for repairs? Paul asked cheerfully. 
There were no signs of mayhem in the living room, however. On the contrary, the children, exhausted by the fun day and the fresh air, were snoozing peacefully on the floor. Spike slept between Josh and Nicky, allowing them to cuddle him on either side. Someone, likely Josh, had thoughtfully covered them all the way with the same plaid blanket. The father and mother exchanged glances before tiptoeing out of the room. Perhaps you should stay and let Josh rest, Amber suggested, unable to hide her joy. If we're not disturbing, the man clarified softly. Amber shook her head. Neither Paul nor Josh, nor even Spike, bothered the woman or the girl that night, or in the following long years of their happy life together. Amber and Paul married a year after they met. Their decision did not seem hasty to them. They understood each other from half a word, complimented each other, and sincerely loved each other. Paul accepted Nicky as his own, even after learning the true history of the girl. Amber, on the other hand, tried her best to become a mother to Josh. It turned out that Josh's mother had died during childbirth. The large family moved into a new house with a backyard where Spike could frolic. Josh fulfilled the role of an older brother, teaching Nikki to ride a scooter or bicycle. Next to her new family, the girl opened up and came alive. Amber thought of her as a flower that had been forced to endure drought and live among the weeds for so long and was finally able to enjoy the rays of the sun, drink rainwater and open her petals. Amber was so happy that sometimes she was afraid to wake up and realize that everything that was happening was just a dream. Her life could not have turned out more beautifully. Amber had a particular strategy in raising both children. She praised them for all their endeavors, rejoiced at any success, even the most insignificant, supported their every step and hobby. She never missed an event, neither in kindergarten nor in school. She shared her love equally, trying not to deprive either of the children. This is how Amber realized the meaning of the phrase, there is no such thing as other people's children. After all, both Josh and Nikki were hers. Josh had been swimming since he was six years old. He had inherited this passion from his father, who, in his youth, had even been a member of the swimming team. Nikki, on the other hand, was not particularly eager to do sports. The girl liked to draw more, so she was sent to art school at the age of five. You, Nikki, will probably become like me, an architect or designer, maybe even an artist. Amber smiled when her daughter showed her drawings. But Nikki, trying to imitate her brother in everything, declared, I want to be like Josh. To become such a naughty child, you have to try very hard. Paul laughed, while Josh snorted like a disgruntled hedgehog. Everything changed when Nikki attended Josh's first competition. The girl was seven years old and Josh was already ten. Before that, he had been practicing swimming for his own pleasure. But lately, ambition had begun to show in the young man. He wanted to receive medals for his achievements. Nikki sat between her parents, all on pins and needles. When Josh beautifully dived into the water on the whistle, the girl jumped up and squeezed her eyes shut with excitement for her favorite brother. The next second, however, she opened them, afraid of missing something. Mummy, how fast he swims! Like a fish! The girl exclaimed admiringly, watching the splashes left behind by the young athlete. The first swim was not a failure. Josh received a medal, second place and a silver medal. Nikki jumped up applauding her brother so hard that her palms turned red. The competition and Josh's success made such a deep impression on the girl that she also expressed a desire to try herself as a swimmer. Her parents did not take her request seriously, deciding that it was made on emotion, but they enrolled her in the pool. After all, swimming lessons were extremely useful. Only Nikki surprised everyone, even her coach. Your daughter has a real talent, a natural ability to swim, she said, when the girl had been in the pool for only a year. Nikki feels like a fish in the water. Have you ever thought of sending her to a sports school? The parents listened to the coach's words and, after discussing everything with their daughter, decided they would raise an athlete. Within two years of lessons, the child confidently 
mastered all the necessary swimming styles, including breaststroke, backstroke, and butterfly. At the age of 15, Nikki began competing in international competitions. They wrote about her in the newspaper, titling the article, If we need a golden youth, then only someone like her. The journalist's words describing Nikki made Amber feel an unprecedented sense of pride. With tears of happiness in her eyes, the woman cut out the article and added it to a memorable album. Both her father and older brother were proud of her success. When Nikki was asked about what helped her reach such heights as a young age, the girl answered, My parents and older brother. Of course, the coach was the driving force that forced me to move forward, but my mum was the person who supported me along the way. Nikki smiled and added, My mum is an angel. On the wave of fame, Nikki began receiving various invitations from the media and magazines. By the age of 17, she was even appearing on magazine covers and in advertisements for sportswear showcasing her abilities as a model. Probably, rumours about the girl reached the island of Bali, or another corner where Samantha lived at the time. Nikki's natural mother easily found her address. When she appeared on the doorstep of Amber's house, all members of the family were gathered. It was summer, and the calendar showed a long-awaited day off. The family members settled in the backyard. Paul was grilling kebabs for dinner, and Amber was setting the table under the roof of the patio. Paul had built this patio by his own hands, and he was very proud of it. Josh was sunbathing with his girlfriend, Molly. Both students had closed their session at the university a week ago, so they deserved a vacation. Josh did not connect his life with swimming, but to the surprise of all family members, he entered the architectural school. Amber supported him. Besides, she still had the right connections, so she was able to help her son. Recently, they took a new dog, also a Labrador, but this time black. Jack was chasing a butterfly, doing pirouettes, bouncing and clacking his teeth, trying to catch it in mid-air. Spike, who in a way united the family, died of old age. They grieved for him greatly, but consoled themselves with the fact that the dog had lived a long and honourable life. Only Nicky was missing in the backyard. The girl, who had been sunbathing and gossiping with Molly and her brother, received a phone call. The girl blushed and, apologising, ran into the house. Amber couldn't help but notice how her daughter's voice changed when she said into the receiver, Hi, oh, and the happy smile on the girl's face could not be ignored either. Amber crept up to her husband from behind, tugging him. I think Nikki has fallen in love, she whispered. Yes? Paul immediately tensed up, looking anxiously at the door, behind which her daughter had disappeared. She's still a little girl. And when could she fall in love, if she's in the water all the time? Amber burst out laughing. She'll be 18 soon, Paul, she reminded her husband. That's what I mean, she's still a child. The man continued to grumble, turning the flavorful meat on the skewers. Amber shook her head, smiling. Of course, for you, your daughter will always be a child, even when she goes to the altar. What altar, Amber? The, s the husband theatrically clutched at his heart. Stop scaring me, okay? The woman laughed. Standing on tiptoe, she kissed the man on the chin, overgrown with two-day stubble. The slight beard suited him just fine, though. At that moment, she turned her head, and the smile slowly began to slip from her face. Amber furrowed her eyebrows and squinted, as if she thought her eyesight was failing her. It couldn't be her little sister standing in the yard of the house, could it? However, this mirage was soon noticed by the rest of the family. Hello, the owner of the house spoke first. Who are you? I... Samantha took an uncertain step towards her sister. Hi, Amber. Your gate was open. I heard the music and the dog and realized that you were here. Amber frowned even more. Her husband saw that his wife turned pale, and her fingers clenched into fists. What are you doing here, Samantha? She asked gruffly. Have you had your fun, or did you bring another child to me? Even Amber had not expected to hear such harsh words from herself. However, 
It was only when she saw her younger sister's tanned face that she realized how angry she was with her. Not because she had dumped the baby on her, but because she had abandoned her daughter, a tiny defenseless creature. Why are you speaking with me like that? Samantha whimpered in her usual tone of voice. I came to ask for your forgiveness. I realized many things during this time. I was young and stupid then, but I want to see my daughter. Oh, I'm sure you've already seen her, Amber retorted. On TV, for example? That's why you came back, isn't it? What attracted you, Samantha? Your daughter's career? Maybe because she's popular and makes good money. Or the chance to give an interview or appear on a TV show. Be honest. Samantha tightened her lips, as if her sister's words had hurt her deeply. How could you think that about me? The woman sobbed angrily. You're wrong. It's just that I've realized many things during this time. I want to see Nikki, and you cannot forbid me. I am her mother. Before Amber's eyes, it was as if a red veil had descended. For a moment, she thought that if she had one of the skewers in her hand, she would have thrown it at her sister like a spear. What am I supposed to think? That you missed her? I'm sorry, darling, but you've been away for over 15 years, and you cannot, you have no right, to come into my house to claim any rights over my daughter. Do you hear? She is my daughter. Amber only realized that she had begun to lash out threateningly at her sister when Samantha started to back away. The younger sister looked up into the older one's face with amazement and consternation. She had never encountered such a reaction from the sensible and kind Amber. Mom! The two women heard the girl's voice and turned in the direction of the sound. What's going on here? Nikki froze on the threshold with the phone in her hand. She looked from Amber to Samantha and back again. Nikki! Samantha rushed to her before Amber could stop her. Nikki! My daughter! The girl didn't even have time to recoil, but her biological mother was already hugging her. Samantha cried, holding Nikki close to her. Honey, forgive me if you can, she begged the girl. I realize what a monstrous mistake I have made, but I've paid for it, my darling. Not a day goes by that I don't think of you. I have no happiness in my life. No family or loved ones are left. I have wanted to come back to ask for your forgiveness, but I was ashamed to look into your eyes, daughter. Amber, boiling with rage, wanted to approach her sister, to unhook her from her daughter. Anger and fear rose inside her. She was afraid that Samantha could take away her daughter. Her husband touched her shoulder, reassuring her and holding her in place. Your sister is already here, the man said softly. Whatever's supposed to happen, let it happen. Amber pressed her lips together, anxiously watching the events unfold. She didn't realize when Josh and Paul stood at her sides, as if protecting her. I don't hold a grudge against you, Nikki said calmly. They say that only happy people do not hold grudges and do not bear grudges. You know, I'm delighted, even though you tried to achieve the opposite. I've never, Samantha began to cry, tears welling up in her eyes. Nikki shook her head and carefully released herself from Samantha's arms. She took a step away from her and said, Mummy never hid the truth about you. I used to wonder what I would say if I met you. All sorts of angry and hurtful thoughts came into my head, but they all evaporated, as if those feelings had a shelf life that had long since expired. Now, I guess what I want to say to you is, thank you. Nikki paused for a moment, as if weighing her decision. Then she nodded decisively and said, Yes, I am grateful to you for being a bad mother. If all this hadn't happened, if you had left me with you, where would I be now? Probably not at the top of the pedestal, that's for sure. Because you never believed in me. That's not fair, Samantha shouted. I saw the note you left before you left me, Nikki said sternly. You offered to throw me in the trash because I didn't speak, and which one of us was being unfair. Amber was aghast, covering her mouth with her hand. She had no idea her daughter had found that ill-fated piece of paper. Back then, 
Amber, after crumpling up her sister's note, straightened it out again and put it back into the folder with the letters and documents. She had no hidden agenda. She just decided to always remember that her sister was an unworthy person. But she didn't know the burden her daughter lived with. Amber's eyes filled with tears. I was young and foolish, but the important thing is to admit your mistakes, isn't it? Samantha continued to justify herself. You can't imagine how difficult it was for me alone with a child in my arms. Anyway, I am your mother. I only have one mother, Nikki stated categorically, and it's definitely not you. And you're lucky that my mum raised me well enough that I didn't set a dog on you right now. Josh snorted with laughter and said, You know, I was raised by my father, not by my mum until I was five. I can afford to take some liberties. Jack, come here, boy. The Labrador, wagging his tail happily, came running at his master's voice. Samantha blushed with anger, eyeing the dog warily. If you think I'm going to leave it like that, Samantha tossed to her sister before walking away. Do you really have a choice? Amber snorted. An hour later, all the family were sitting at the table. Despite her smile, Amber was shaking inside. Her sister's appearance had knocked her out of her rut. She was brought out of her pensive state by the light touch of her daughter's hand. Amber looked at Nikki, smiling, and said, Mum, I love you. Thankful that I have you. Amber wanted to answer that she too loved her daughter endlessly, was proud of her, that the greatest happiness in the world was to be her mum, but she couldn't open her mouth because her throat was full of tears. Tears of happiness. Sometimes Amber was asked if she wished she had natural children. At such moments, Amber looked at those people with sincere incomprehension and said, But I have my natural kids. And there was not a drop of falsity in her words. They were sincere and coming from the heart of a true mother.